Let's read the first 17 verses of Mark chapter 5. And they came over unto the side, the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, really should be boat, Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now the statement unclean spirit simply means a a demonic spirit. So it was a demon. (coughs) Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters, and chains, and the chains had been plucked or broken, we would say, uh, by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame or subdue him. <clears throat> and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, He ran and worshipped him. Now, worshipping here doesn't mean that he actually worshipped him as Christians worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It literally means that he fell uh, on his knees before him. And that's all it means. So don't get the idea that he actually worshipped him as Christians worship the Lord. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee or with you? Jesus, thou Son of the Most High, I adjure you, or I implore you, by God, that thou torment me not. And he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion. That means many. Now, how many? You and I do not know. We can't even imagine how many demons there are. But keep this in mind. They were all created. They were not procreated. They don't continue to increase. So we have the same number now that there was in the beginning because they were created individuals. Verse 10. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there, nigh unto the mountains, a great herd of swine feeding. <clears throat> and all the, see it says devils, this is one of the mistakes that the King James makes. There's only one devil, many demons. So it should be demons. And all the demons besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000, and choked, that literally means they were drowned, in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the demon, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the demon and also concerning the swine. And they began to entreat him to depart out of the coasts. That's as far as we'll read tonight. So we want to complete our study of the subject of demons for the time being. Now, first of all, we know that a demon, the meaning in the Greek is a knowing one or one who has great knowledge. And I might add the knowledge which demons have is a supernatural knowledge. Not supernatural in the same sense that God is supernatural, but their knowledge far exceeds the knowledge of any human being. They've had a long time to to gain a lot of knowledge, haven't they? So they are knowing ones, we could say, and that would be the correct 
term to use. They were knowing ones, and their knowledge was certainly supernatural and is beyond what we would call natural knowledge. So besides Satan's headship of fallen angels, the partners of his fall, he is also the prince of demons. And I mean by that he's the leader. He's the prince of demons. And that's what we're told in Matthew 9 and verse 34. <clears throat> we also know that he is not only the prince of demons or the head of the demons, but he is also the God of this age in which we live. He's the God of this world. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. So every sinner under the power of Satan is, in a sense, not in his right mind. Now, that's a strong statement, but I made it, and that's true. It's according to the Scriptures. He's not in his right mind. He's out of his mind, so to speak. Now, since man's greatest foes are spiritual, <clears throat> then his strength, uh, strength and preparation must be outside and above himself. Surely we do not think that we are capable of coping uh, with the demons because we're not. We're not intelligent enough. Now, we have a lot of folk who think they're intelligent, but they're not as intelligent as they think they are. So we're not capable of doing it within ourselves. We can overcome only in the strength and the wisdom that God gives to us who are the recipients of God's grace. <clears throat> I'd like to say at this point there are, there are different kinds of demons. I'd like to elaborate on that for a few minutes. Some are base and filthy. And some... Are, are actually refined and moral. In other words, they adapt themselves to the situation. They're like politicians. They can just adapt to the situation, whatever it is. And uh, we have some examples of this, of course, in the study of the Scriptures. <clears throat> now, fallen angels are called demons. What are they? They're fallen angels. <clears throat> They fell when Lucifer fell. So there are those who followed Satan in his rebellion against God. <clears throat> there are Satan's angels, Matthew 25, 41, and Revelation 12, 9. The archangel who is over them is the strong man of Matthew 12, 29, who is yet to be bound, and his whole house are following destroyed. And that's in the bottomless pit. That's in eternal hell. Now, Satan is the king over two realms. Two realms. First, the realm of the fallen spirits, who are demons. Uh, Mark 5, 9 and 15. Luke 8 and verse 30. And secondly, that of the cosmos, which I've already mentioned. Ephesians 2, 2. Ephesians 6.12, 2 Corinthians 4.4, and Revelation 2.13. <clears throat> now, demons are to be distinguished from angels. They're fallen angels, but they're to be distinguished from angels. Demons are said to possess human bodies but you will not find anywhere in all the scriptures where angels possess human bodies. So you don't have a, an angel in you. <laughs> if you're a Christian, you have the grace of God. You have the Spirit of the Lord. You have the third person of the Godhead dwelling in you. You don't have an angel in you. That doesn't mean that we do not have angels as ministering spirits, Hebrews 1, verse 14, ministering to those who shall be heirs of salvation. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. And uh, the Psalms even speak of the guardian angels. And, of course, a lot of people hoot at that, but I don't hoot at anything that's biblical. If people want to hoot at it, well, they can hoot. But I'll tell you, their hoot's going to be turned into something else one of these days. <clears throat> so the first major distinction between the angels and demons is 
that demons do inhabit human bodies, but uh, angels do not inhabit human bodies. So keep that in mind when we get into Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> demons have been active in the world from the very dawn of human history. We go back to the Garden of Eden, and we know this to be a fact. However, there are times when they are more active than they are at other times, and there is a reason for that. For example, during the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, I've made this statement before, but I'll repeat it again. During the first advent of Jesus Christ, they were very active. Now, why were they so active during the first advent of Christ? There's a reason for it. They were also very active even during the time of the apostles. You'll find even in the Acts of the Apostles uh, where the demons were active and Paul encountered the demons and so forth. So they were active during the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ and they will also be very active before and during the first part, of course, when Christ comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the question is, why is this true? Well, during the <clears throat> presence of Christ, after all, they are the great antagonist of Christ. They are the ones working against Christ. And they're working against Christ under the, under the direction of uh, their leader, uh, Lucifer himself. Now, in considering the service <clears throat> of the of these beings uh, to Satan, it is important to distinguish between demon possession and, secondly, demon influence. Demon possession is one thing. Demon influence is another thing, and I'll illustrate that. In the one case, the body is entered and a dominating control is gained. That's demon possession. Now, we won't have time to look at these scriptures, but I'll give you a few as we make this distinction so you can study this for yourself. So let me make this statement once again. <clears throat> We're talking about demon possession now. They enter the body, and when they enter the body, they gain dominating control. Matthew 12, 43, and 45. You remember the man who had one demon, and then he went out, but when he came back, it was vacant, and he brought seven with him. <laughs> okay. Matthew 12, 43 and 45. The twelfth verse of the passage which we read tonight, Mark 5, 12. Matthew 8 and verse 16. Matthew 9, 32 and 33. Acts 8, verses 6 and 7. And Acts 16, verse 16. Now, these all illustrate demon possession. Now, <clears throat> in the other case, there is a warfare, tremendous warfare from without, and this, this warfare is carried on by demons. And so this, this brings up the subject of uh, suggestion on the part of those who are outside, temptation, and influence. Three things to consider. So where they do not possess, they do suggest, they do tempt, and they do give influence. In other words, they influence people. Matthew 26, verse 41. Now, it is reasonable to conclude that they, like their monarch, Lucifer himself, are adapting the manner of their activity to the enlightenment of the age and locality. For example, they would not act in America the same way they would act maybe in Africa or China. And I'm talking about where there are heathen people who have never been subjected, uh, uh, generally speaking, to any biblical principles. So they would act differently there than they do in places where they have been subjected, people have been subjected uh, to more truth. <clears throat> and let me, 
let me give you a classic example. They acted differently in Athens, Acts 17, when the Apostle Paul uh, brought his famous message on Mars Hill. He was speaking to the intelligentsia of his age. They were philosophers there, and they had idols everywhere. Now, they didn't act in the same way uh, at Athens as they acted in Corinth. You see what I'm saying? Entirely different. Corinth was a very wicked city. Yes, there was an assembly there, the, the church at Corinth or the assembly at Corinth. But uh, as a result of the things that they had done, you know, some of them had been uh, really steeped in all kinds of sins, and those sins are described in the uh, sixth chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians, beginning with verse 9 through about verse 11. And the Sodom is even mentioned among those sins, and some other horrible things. So many of the Corinthians had come out of that kind of environment, some of them that had been saved by God's grace. Well, let's take time and go there for just a moment. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> I don't have my Greek uh, text with me tonight, and therefore I can't give you the translation on it. But um, turn and you can, uh, you can make it out for yourself. Turn to the 6th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and let's begin with verse 9. And as we read this, of course, I'm not just calling attention to this because we hear it so much today. But I heard uh, just today that uh, some fellow who is a homo as a state representative in, in Austin, he has, uh, he's going to uh, present a bill, hoping to get it passed, to marry homosexuals in the state of Texas. So, folk, you talk about a breakdown. Oh, I mean, it's going, to, it's going to get so bad that we're going to say, even so come Lord Jesus. And I believe that's going to happen shortly, too. Let's begin with verse 9. <clears throat> Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now watch this. Now he's going to name them. Be not deceived, writing to the Corinthians, neither fornicators. Well, folks, fornication, that's, a, that's just something that is just spreading like wildfire. Nor idolaters nor adulterers. Now you see there is a difference between fornication and adultery. Or you wouldn't have the two different words in the same text. I said there is a difference. Nor effeminate. Now you know who he's talking about here? <laughs> talking about sodomites, folks. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what are they saying today? Well, they have their homosexual churches and all that, homosexual preachers, and they want to be accepted everywhere. And they say they can't help it. That's a lie. They're born that way. That's a lie. That's a lie. Now notice what Paul says in the next two verses. I want you to see that demons operated differently in Athens than they did in Corinth. Then Paul says, And such were, were some of you. That's past tense. Some of those in the, in the assembly at Corinth were guilty of these sins that have just been mentioned. But by grace, they were saved. So, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawfully said unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So I just wanted to show that there, is, there was a difference. Now let's, let's turn to Acts, the 17th chapter. Let me show you what uh, the Apostle Paul was up against when he went to Athens to preach his 
famous sermon and the people that uh, he had to face. We'll begin with verse 16, Acts 17. <clears throat> now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. I know what he meant. Don't you have an idea of what Paul meant? Paul was stirred by all of the idolatry and all the mess that he saw just as I'm stirred when I see things that are taking place before our eyes and they're getting worse and worse. So he says, <clears throat> when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, wholly given to idolatry. Did any of you hear, now how much truth there is in this, I, I don't know the exact amount, but before last Sunday's so-called Super Bowl game, did any of you hear on the news how much money would be bet uh, in the United States? Did, did any of you hear? Let's see your hand. Did any of you hear? One trillion, wasn't it? One trillion dollars would be bet in America over the Super Bowl game. One trillion, folks. kind of making a god out of things, aren't they? I just thought I'd throw that in, make it a little practical as we go along. All right? So let's go a step further. <clears throat> when he saw the holy city given to idolatry, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him, then certain philosophers philosophers, notice this, of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? <laughs> so you know what they think about preachers, don't you? <laughs> what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? And let's drop down to verse 22. Here is the beginning of his message. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. In other words, you're just too religious. See, there's a difference between being religious and being a Christian. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, notice that, your devotions, the marginal reference says, gods that ye worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Now notice what Paul does. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So I'm declaring the very one that you do not know. Now, that's, that's far enough, but I want you to see the difference. Here he was speaking to the so-called intellectuals of his day. Now, the demons wouldn't operate. The demons were there. What about all the superstition? What about all their idols? They were there. They were influencing them. But they were not homos. They were not leading them in that direction, you see. We have no reference to that. So I want you to see the difference. So demons adapt themselves. So don't think that every demon, every person who wallows in the mire and the drunken, he's a, he's, a, he's a drunk or he's an alcoholic, I should say, and uh, he's or addicted to dope or something else like that. Folks, that's just one form. But demons adapt themselves to whatever the circumstances may be. And that's the point that I want to make. But what will this babbler say? I'd like to make a remark on that before we go back to Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> Do we really realize just how unsaved people detest the Word of God, the truth of God? They're always exposed. You see, when, when people come and sit under the preaching of God's Word, if the truth is preached, they're going to be exposed. We're all supposed to be exposed. As Christians, if we're not doing what we ought to do, we need to be exposed. 
exposed to ourselves and see ourselves as God sees us. But the unsaved, they have a hatred, they have a detestation for the truth that you can't imagine if they just admit it. Now, I want to give you an illustration from the Old Testament. You remember Elijah? You remember the, uh, the children who said, uh, Go up, thou bald head. <laughs> Go up, thou bald head. How many remember that? that poor? And then the bears came and got them. Now, you wonder about that? That was God's judgment. In the first place, children doesn't mean they were little innocent, little innocent children, as some people would say. They were not that at all. You need to study the word children in the Hebrew. Not that, not that at all. They had knowledge. They knew what they were saying. They knew what they were doing. They were actually making fun of him. So I can expect people to make fun. Paul had people to make fun of him, made fun of him. What will his babbler say? So demons adapt themselves. Let us not forget that point, please. <clears throat> but they do influence, they suggest, they tempt, etc. So it is reasonable to conclude that they like their monarch, their leader. They adapt themselves to the manner of their activity, to the enlightenment of the age and the locality in which they may be working. And do not forget what Paul said about false angels in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. False angels. And a demon is a false angel. Is a fallen angel or a false angel. So their influence is prompted by two motives. And what are their two major motives? Number one, to hinder the purpose of God. At least they think they can maybe hinder the purpose of God being worked out in God's people. And secondly, to extend the authority of Satan, their leader, his people. So, we have the cruelty, the power, and the malice of Satan. Three things. Cruelty, power, and malice of Satan are revealed in the passage that we're looking at tonight. Mark 5, 1 through 17. Let's look at these three things for a moment in the light of what we have read. <clears throat> Number one, the cruelty of Satan is displayed in the miserable condition of the man who dwelt among the tombs. And that no man could either chain or subdue him. They're like a wild person. So Satan can stir up the minds of men to evil deeds, but when this is done, he cannot control them. He can't do that. You see, he's not sovereign. He's not omnipotent. Then let's look at their power. The power of Satan appears in the awful words which the unclean spirit used. When our Lord asked, What is your name? And what was the answer? My name is Legion. Verse 9. So we do not have the faintest idea of the number, the subtlety, or the activity of Satan's agents. And that's what demons are, Satan's agents. <clears throat> Thirdly, let's look at the malice of Satan. And as this malice is propagated and manifested by the fallen angels or the demons. So the malice of Satan appears in the strange petition. And what was the strange petition the demon said, that they asked for? Send us into the swine. It's kind of a strange petition, isn't it? Unable to injure anymore the soul of the man in whom they had been dwelling, had in dwelling, they desired to leave to do injury to the dumb beasts which were feeding near. 
So such is the character of Satan. Now let's go a step further, looking at verse 9. Demons know who Jesus Christ is. <clears throat> I want you to know the demons are greater theologians as far as knowing the truth about Jesus Christ, His person and His work, than many so-called religious theologians who know neither His person nor His work. So they know who Jesus Christ is, verse 9. They also know much about the Scriptures, Matthew chapter 4, when our Lord was tested in the wilderness after being baptized. So here in Mark, they recognize the hypostatic union, the God-man. And this is more than a lot of so-called theologians know. And I've been subjected to quite a few of them in more than 50 years. Let us be beware of giving way to the senseless habit of jesting about Satan. I don't like to hear anybody jest about Satan. Boy, I don't, I don't like it a little bit. I don't like to hear anybody jest about God. I don't like to hear anybody jest about Satan. We should be more concerned about the presence and activities of our greatest enemy. And our greatest enemy is Satan himself. Now looking at the unclean spirit, for the demon is called that in the portion that we have read. The unclean spirit sometimes works unsuspectedly with the cultured and the refined Yes, with the religious, as we have just shown by reading from the 17th chapter of Acts. On the other hand, demons may be fierce. Fierce. Now notice what I'm saying. And we'll get into something interesting in a moment and something that I haven't shared uh, with you. In, well, I don't think I've shared much of what I'm going to give tonight with anybody in this assembly regardless of how long you've been here we'll go into a little area that we haven't gone into I think in the past but uh, <clears throat> Matthew 8 28 shows that they're fierce and make their victims a terror actually make their victims a terror now demons can watch what I'm going to give now Take these things down. We won't have time to discuss all of them, but there are plenty of Scripture on each of these things I'm going to mention. Demons can perceive, perceive, number one. They can understand. They can hate. They can rage. They can speak. They can act and they can tremble. Now, I'll let you look up Scripture for all those. That'll give you something to do. So they are spirits of error, we are told, spirits of error. They're seducing spirits, 1 Timothy 4.1. They are oppressing and tormenting men, Matthew 15.22. Seeking their ruin and their hurt. Revelation 16, 13 and 18, verse 2. Now, we're going to spend some time on this next one. <clears throat> Demons speak. Let's look at this one for a little while tonight. Go with me to the 8th chapter of the book of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8. I'd like for us to begin with the 19th verse. <clears throat> let's read several verses. In fact, let's read verses 19 through 22. These are the last verses in chapter 8. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, now, what do you think a familiar spirit is? 
and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? Then Isaiah said to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it hardly bestead and hungry and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward and they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness dimness of anguish and they shall be driven to darkness now let's Let's look at the familiar spirits that are mentioned in verse 19. Familiar spirits translated into the Greek. Now, this is not in the Koine Greek. This is in classical Greek. And many times when you look up a word in the Septuagint version, which is the Greek of the Hebrew, you have to go to the classical Greek in order to find the word because... The Koine, which is used for our New Testament, was a little different from the classical. And not only that, but you're looking at only a little over 5,000 word vocabulary in the Koine that is in our New Testament. And the classical will take you far beyond that. But before I go into this, let me ask you a question. Familiar spirits, when you translate that into, or what do you think it really refers to? Familiar spirits. What does it really, what does it really refer to? Well, I'll give you a little help on it. Familiar spirits, the Hebrew translated familiar spirits, translated into the Greek, and the Greek word is ing. Now, watch what I, how I'm pronouncing it. It's a, it's a compound word. Ing gastromuthos. Ing gastromuthos. Now, what does it mean? A ventriloquist. All right. So when you when you talk about the muttering and all, I've always been fascinated with a fellow. You know, you remember the days of what was it, Edgar Bergen? You know, and he was. I guess he was about one of the best. Of course, I'm sure they have some just as good as. He was, but I used to see him perform once in a while on TV. But a ventriloquist. So a familiar spirit operates like a ventriloquist. I'm not making this up, folks. I just gave the translation. So in the Hebrew, and then you translate it into the Greek, and the Greek is ing gastromuthos. And it means the same as ventriloquist. So these demons are described, these familiar spirits, as wizards that peep and mutter. What does the NASB say in its translation there, Hank? Consult the mediums and the spiritualists, or spiritists, mm-hmm. spiritualists and spiritists, uh-huh. who whisper and mutter. Yeah, wh- whisper and mutter. All right, so a wizard is a male medium... is a male medium who is demon-possessed. A male medium who is demon-possessed. That's what we're looking at here. And this actually happened in the Old Testament, so we're looking at the passage. So he peeps, that's high sounds, peeps, and mutters, that's low sounds. I'm describing this for you. But these sounds are not of his own making. That is, the medium himself. Not of his own making. You know, I, I wonder sometimes when I hear some people say some things they say, I wonder who's, I wonder really who's speaking through them. <laughs> and folks, it's going to get worse and worse. My wife and I... We're eating. We had to eat a little late yesterday, 
uh, due to something that came up. And when we got through, before we laid down to take a little nap, we had, the, we had been listening to the news uh, from uh, 12 to 12.30 on NBC. And then following that, a program came on. And here was a fellow who was, uh, and you could almost tell what he was doing. I mean, it was not it was not difficult at all. He had a piece of paper, and they'd have a different. And when you look at the woman, you'd say, "Boy, she's weird looking." It it it, it, was, it wasn't surprising to me that she might be possessed. And then after he dealt with her, I'll tell you what he did in just a moment. And um, then they would get another one up there, and she would the next one that went up there was just as weird looking as the first one. But this guy was he had a a pad writing pad and he had a pencil and he was just going like this and of course this woman couldn't keep her eyes off of him you know and he just go like this and went asking her questions he was supposed to tell her about the dead some of her relatives that had died and all about them and see communicating see and so he just he just go like this and and she doesn't know it You know, I've never worried about anybody hypnotizing me. I could sock him if he got too close to me. I could. Several years ago, we had a, a dentist in the church where I was pastor. That's Belfort before we, before we left the convention. And I always was leery of that character. I mean, I was leery of him. So he, one day he said, I want to talk to you, preacher. I said, what do you want to talk about? He said, are, are you against... Um, hypnotizing people. He said, I hypnotize my patients sometimes instead of giving them uh, an, an anesthetic. I said, you wouldn't hypnotize me? And boy, I mean, we had it out. I let him have it with both barrels right between the eyes. And I had a double barrel shotgun. You know what I mean? You, 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 know, what, you know what I mean? <laughs> Not literally. And uh, so he never liked me after that. And they, they moved their membership, and I was really glad. You, you can preach them out, see. But boy, he was weird, and I found out some things about him later. I'm not worried about anybody. You can almost tell about a person who could be easily hypnotized. Did you know that? Now listen to this. Let's look at this closely. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. So a wizard is a male medium who is demon-possessed. I think my wife and I saw some of that yesterday. I have no doubt in my mind about it. But these sounds are not of one's own making, not his making. So... What the peeping and the muttering and so forth, you know what it's been called biblically? It is a ventriloquist demon. He's acting like a ventriloquist. I didn't make that up, folks. I got that from study. So the verse <clears throat> then asks the question, should not a people seek their God? Notice that. For the living to the dead? So people should go to the living God instead of going to the dead. So this has to do with necromancy. See what I'm talking about? Contact with the dead. Look at Isaiah... 29 verse 4 Isaiah 29 verse 4 and we're going to see all kinds of this kinds of stuff today 29 and verse 4 and thou shall be brought down and shall speak out of the ground and thy speech shall be low out of the dust and thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit. There you are again. Out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. 
Now, folks, that's, that's in the book. I said, that's in the book. So what is spiritism? It is a satanic cult. And today, while we were eating our evening meal, turned the TV on the little one in the kitchen, and uh, looked at a program, and they were talking about had women up there who claimed that they had been, their parents had been in uh, a safe, in, in a satanic cult and all this kind of stuff. And so then they had um, uh, also some psychologists there and some psychiatrists there. And, and you hear one, you hear the other, you know, it's all a mess. Just a big mess. So then let's look at the next word. We have a wizard here. Familiar spirits and then wizards. Now, let's look at the word wizard. Literally means much knowing. That's the meaning of the word, much knowing. Supernatural intelligence. So by the fact that man possesses a spirit, he must seek support for that spirit in the day of mental strain and distress. So the unsaved person who has no support, he doesn't have grace, he doesn't have any support, he's a fit target for all this kind of stuff. He's an open target for familiar spirits. Now Satan does not allow that vacuum, watch what I'm saying, that vacuum to go without filling it in his way and for his own purposes. So mediums will tell their clients just what the clients want to hear. Are you listening to me, folks? You see, I don't worry about those things. When you know the Word of God, you don't worry about those things. You can, you can see it coming and put it right where it belongs. But a person who is not a Christian, who knows nothing about the Word of God, he's a fit target. Now, Isaiah shows in verse 20 that the only resource, only resource for faith in any age is the Word of God. And you don't find many people today who are interested in studying the Scriptures, do you? So religionists, unsaved religionists, they're fit targets for these very things about which we have been speaking. So there is a distressing picture of misery in verses 21 and 22. Therefore, in the midst of this thick darkness without, and folks outside of the assembly of Christ, outside of the Christian life, there is nothing but darkness. Nothing but darkness. So the last verse of chapter 8 tells of some who prefer any, any source of assumed intelligence. And we're living in that age now. We're seeing this manifested today. So I'm giving you something that's up to date. even though it be diabolical. However, there are some who cleave to that word and testimony, and on them light shall shine. Now let's go back to the fifth chapter to close out our study this evening. <clears throat> So demons speak. They can imitate the dead. So people who have lived in the past can be brought right into the 20th century. Through what? Demonism. Through the familiar spirits, the unclean spirits. So do not forget that demons do not die. They don't die, folks. They just move out of one body when the, a person dies and move right into another body, a living person. They don't die. 
They don't increase in population and they don't die. Now the raging and acting of demons, they're raging and they're acting, are manifested in this chapter, chapter 5, and we're just looking at the first 17 verses. Let's look at another point. Demons tremble. Tremble. Let's look at that one. Turn to James chapter 2, verse 19. Demons do things that religionists do not do. Unregenerate people do not do. But they do. And listen to this. And you know why? Because they're intelligent creatures. They know who Jesus Christ is. They know what their doom is. They know that they have a short time to work, and therefore they're working diligently. Would to God that we as Christians would redeem the time knowing that the days are evil. Look at verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, one God, once again, you see the devils. That's wrong translation. It's demons. The demons also believe and tremble. They believe and they tremble or they shudder. So they know who Jesus Christ is. They know He's the Holy One. They know that He is going to execute judgment. They know that their time is short. And judgment is coming. They don't make fun of judgment. They don't scoff at judgment. They know better. They're too intelligent to do that. So when you find people today scoffing at judgment, you need to say, well, you're, you're an ignoramus. You're worse off than the demons. The demons are smarter than you. And they're not only smarter than you, they tremble in the presence of the truth. And you're not even doing that. And when you see church members that don't tremble, you're just looking at when the truth is preached and realize that God is a God of judgment and He's going to judge His own people if they're disobedient. You're just looking and you're talking to people who do not have the grace of God. That's just how simple it is. So they tremble. Next, demon possession was such a serious crime in the Old Testament under the law that it merited capital punishment. Proof of it, Leviticus 20:27. 20, they were killed. Now, we're not under the judicial aspect of the law, folks, any more than we are under the ceremonial aspect of the law. But it was a capital offense. It merited death under the law. Not only that, but we also know that fornicators and, and adulterers and homosexuals and all the rest of them, it was a capital offense under the judicial aspect of the law. Now, the methods of demon possession are, let me give you their methods. And their methods don't change. So the methods I'm going to give you tonight, they will become more sophisticated in the development and the execution of their methods and so forth, but they're the same. Number one is idolatry. Idolatry. When anything comes between a Christian and his God, it's an idol, folks. It's an idol. Anything that comes between a Christian and God, it's an idol. That's why John said in 1 John 5 and verse 21, put away from among yourselves idols. But look at, I'll give you some scriptures, 1 Corinthians 10, 14, and 19 through 21. So there are demons in the vicinity of every idol. You can rest assured of that. I said demons are in the vicinity of of every idol. 
and idolatry is forbidden. Exodus 23 and 4 and 23, Deuteronomy 4 and 28. And it's related to revolt against God. And that's why it's so heinous. It's a revolt against God. So idolatry, that's number one. First method. Number two, through religion, they operate through religion. Acts 17. And I've already given that portion of Scripture, so no need of turning to it and reading it again. And number three is sex perversion. I don't know about you, but I hear so much. That I, I'm getting to the place now where I don't, even, I don't listen to the news as much as I have in the past. I try to keep up with things. But if it gets any worse, you can just go two or three days and get it, and you'll get the same thing with it getting a little worse between the last time you heard it and what it is at the time that you hear again. But sex perversion, all kinds of sex perversion. All right, I'll give you the passage, Romans 1. Just read it, study it. Read what we have in the book. Abnormal sex activities are attributed to demonism. There are demons for every type of sexual activity. Homosexuality, lesbianism, group origins, sadism, and promiscuity. Now, in closing tonight, the demons know Jesus Christ from afar. Let's look at that verse. I think this is also stated in one of the verses that we read. From afar. And it's also, yes, verse 7. Look at verse 7 again. And cried with a loud voice and said, now this is the unclean spirit, what have I to do with you? What do I have to do with you, to put it in our vernacular? Jesus, you son of the most high God. And then he says, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. So this explains not only chapter 5, verse 7, but also James 2 and verse 19. Now it may seem strange to us on the surface why demons should be so clear and instantaneous in their understanding of the nature of Christ while men in general are so slow to comprehend the truth of the person of Christ. Think about that for a moment. For the demons, these great truths are not abstract principles, as they often seem to men in general. So the demons knew Jesus Christ from afar, and it was out of fear. That's why they tremble, out of fear. That's why they tremble. But you know, in Romans 3 and verse 18, when Paul gave those horrible indictments, 14 of them, against every unregenerate person, the last one is, no fear of God before their eyes. That can't be said of the demons. So the Bible differentiates between degrees of demon possession. And this is my final point. The Bible differentiates between degrees of possession. Let me give you some examples of this. Ordinarily, it is a demon. A man is possessed of a demon. I said ordinarily. That's what you'll find in the study of the subject. But in Mark 16 and verse 9... Seven demons are mentioned. Turn to Mark 16, verse 9. 
Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast how many? Seven. Seven demons. Now, one demon is bad, but seven is seven times worse. Now, what's the third point? One demon is expelled, and I'm talking about Matthew 12, 43 through 45, so you can study it for yourself. One demon is expelled, but he returns with seven comrades. Seven comrades who were more wicked than himself. Now let's turn and read that. Let's, let's, let's not let that pass by. Turn to the 12th chapter of Matthew and let us read beginning with verse 43. I'd like for us to go back up to verse 41 to begin our reading. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house. From whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Now, folks, that was Israel's condition at one time, and this is what our Lord is explaining here. Then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So he's worse off with seven, seven de demons who are more wicked than the one that was once in him. So you can see what his condition was. And that's what we're going to see in the last days. A demon will go out and maybe seven or maybe a lot more than that come in. And you'll see the person get more wicked and do, do more dastardly things than he's ever done. This is not imagination, folks. This is the teaching of Scripture. Now, why seven? You don't find any more than just seven mentioned. Why seven? What's the number of the seven? What, is it, what does it really tell us in the Scriptures? Numbers have a very important meaning, especially in the Hebrew. Did you know in the, in the Hebrew alphabet, when you have the 22 letters... In all the charts where they have the Hebrew alphabet, over to the right, they'll have the first uh, letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph, and then Beth, and so forth. It'll have the meaning of that number right down. So always with every alphabet, there is a number. Then if you get up into large numbers in the Hebrew, you've got to take whatever numbers are there in the alphabet, you put it together, and you, you have the number. Sometimes it takes several of the Hebrew letters to give you the true meaning of a certain number. But the number seven stands for completion. So, what do we have? One demon is expelled. He returns with seven more wicked than himself. And seven is the number of completion as far as the work of the demons in that individual. Now this last statement. There are varying degrees of control by Satan just as there are varying degrees of control by the Holy Spirit. So there are varying degrees of control in the unregenerate by Satan, by familiar or unclean spirits or demons, 
just as there are varying degrees of control in the life of a believer by the Holy Spirit within. Now that brings up a subject that is certainly worthy of a lot of consideration, which I'll just let you think about it sometime. We may, we may develop that further and get into that. Let us stand. <clears throat>